time. Um, at this time, we'll call the roll. Mm-hmm. Hope everyone had a wonderful break. Okay, Ms. Bazemore, Coalition for Black Student Achievement. Okay, Ms. Coleman Farrell, I believe Dr. Sheffield received notification that she would not be in attendance. Mr. Collins is here in person. Dr. Diaz had responded no to the invite Hispanic Education Coalition, and I don't see him on. <clears throat> Reginald is here virtually. Laura Fellman, School District 6. Rachel Frischberg, School Board District 3. Randy Gabriel. Is Rachel on? Present. Think. Are you there, Rach? Randy, you're, Randy, you're here. Yes, I'm here. Rachel's here. And Rachel's here. Excellent. Okay. For the sake of recording, if I can just let the, if we can let them say if they're present or absent. Okay. Sherelle Golden, School Board 1, District 1. Present. Thank you. Chair Postel. Hi. Present. Imran Siddiqui, School Board District 5. Corey Smith, School Board District 7. And Christine Tibbs, School Board District 2. Present. Okay, Laura Feldman, School Board District 6 member. Hi, here. Thank you. That gives us our quorum. Hearing that we have a quorum, next item on the agenda approval of minutes. The minutes was distributed previously by um, staff for December 12th, and if there are there any questions or discussions regarding the minutes? Hearing none, the district do it a little differently. Robert, rule of order, you don't take minutes, but for some reason we have um, established that norm of approving minutes with a um, motion. So I, I will entertain a motion at this time. This is Randy, I'll motion for approval of the minutes. I second it. And Reg who was I? Reggie. Ready. Most, uh, a motion is on the floor. All in favor, here and there is no discussion. Any opposed? Motion carries. At this time, we open the floor to public comment. And I would like at this, this time to give the opportunity of um, Dr. Sheffield, if you would like to introduce or if all the respective individuals in the room can introduce themselves. Um, Madam Chair, I will allow them to open mic and introduce themselves. I'll start. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Rieger. I'm the Chief of Human Resources here at the school district. Good evening, I'm Elaine Gallagher, Director of Recruitment and Retention here at the School District. Hello everyone, Happy New Year. I am Tara Brook. I am currently the Program Planner over K through 12 Accelerated Learning. Thank you all for being here. And given we're at 550, just wanna give that opportunity, that minute opportunity for any public comment. Um, are there any public comments online? Dr. Schaefer, do you see any? Um, no, I don't see anyone um, online for public comments, and we do not have any guests here visiting in the room. Thank you. At this time, updates from Chief Academic Office. Um, again, good 
Good afternoon, everyone, and happy new year to, um, to each of you. Thanks for getting on with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to, of course, keep my comments short as we're just returning from the new year. I gave a very complex um, update prior to us going out for the winter holidays. Um, we do have, because we do have two presentations this afternoon, and I want to make certain that I leave time for them. And um, before I talk a little bit in regards to just some brief updates, as the agenda is indicated here, we're going to have um, Tara Baruch, our program planner around our gift acceleration, is just going to update us as it pertains to, you know, the progress and the work that we are doing around our gifted education. And I just want to remind everyone, you know, it's always a work in progress and we're just being transparent. Um, and of course, just sharing with you where we are and of course take your feedback because our goal is always to move to the right to just get better um, and in closing those gaps that um, we may be identifying here and then we also um, at the request at the beginning of the year another topic that came forth you asked that if i could have um, our chief of hr and her staff to join us um, to just talk in regards to the work that we're doing around human resources as it pertains to the vacancies within our schools um, and not just looking at the vacancies but what are the some of the strategies or some of the initiatives that we are doing here as a district to try to deal with the national crisis um, because this is not just unique here to palm beach county this is around the country as it pertains to um, you know vacancies um, and so forth so we're gonna hear about I'm here from HR as well so um, before we start with our um, guest this evening which will start with the gifted component um, I'm going to just share with you you know that we are in the midst as I talked last around our 612 social studies adoption as well as our k-8 adaptive technology and right now where we are in that process from the last time that we met and i provided you an update is that the um the final items that came from the initial committee are now have been are now shared with the schools um, to where the teachers have an opportunity to review the digital um the digital items that came up as finalists it either were the top two or the top three, dependent on the grade levels. So teachers have um, the month of January to where they are reviewing the items, they're providing their feedback. Then the committee will meet again after the teachers provide their feedback. And then after they meet, then they will provide me with um, the recommendation that will then go to the superintendent and to the board. So that's just where we are with both of those um, two big pieces of adoption. And also our students are continuing with their progress monitoring um, number two. You know, this is our second go around around the new state accountability piece. Um, hopefully when we meet again in March, not hopefully, excuse me, in February, I'll be able to share with you some data as it, per as it pertains to comparison from progress monitoring one that took place in the fall to in August, September, to where our students end it um, after progress monitoring too. And after they are all done, we are planning what we call essentials to meet with our principals. They will be um, have an opportunity to invite a team where we will meet during the month of February to do those data comparison and to see in terms of the kind of adjustments and, get, uh, and changes that we may need to make instructionally and providing our continue to provide support to our students leading up to the final um, administration of this new progress monitoring tool, which will take place later on in the spring. So, um, you know, again, we have a lot of, you know, initiatives and things taking place. We're just trying to stay the course. We're continuing to work through many of the, you know, legislative um, compliance pieces and making certain that we are being compliant. Um, and, and doing all those necessary pieces that are required um, and just staying busy um, in a good way. So that's it for the, again, the CAO update. That's a very short version because I want to leave time for our guests this evening since we have two big pieces. Thank you. And at this time. Okay, well, what we will do, I'm going to start with, um, and she's introduced herself. Uh, Mrs. Tara Baruch. Mrs. Baruch, again, is our um, program planner for gifted, um, 
get to the right one here. Um, that works with our gifted and acceleration, and I'm going to turn it over to her as she just takes us through as it pertains to where we are and some of those opportunity gaps and the work that we're continuing to do to just move to the right in terms of making progress. Mrs. Baruch. Thank you, Dr. Sheffield. Um, I'm here tonight to share with you our universal screener update um, known as the NNAT3 or Naglieri Nonverbal Ability Test. Um, I'll refer to this test as the Naglieri moving forward. So we are currently in our second year of our three-year rollout plan to include a universal screener for second graders. Just a quick brief background on the Naglieri. The Naglieri is a computer-based nonverbal screener. Um, most of the children, all the directions are nonverbal and everything's delivered through visuals. It assesses a child's strengths and weaknesses in three tested areas, which is your verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative. And one of the reasons why the Nagli area was specifically chosen for this universal screener rollout is because it provides a culturally neutral assessment that is of ideal use with a diverse student population. The importance of having a universal screener in our district is vast, but one of the reasons why this was chosen is the national average will show you that six to 10% of screened students for gifted meet requirements for gifted identification. Currently, the school district of Palm Beach County population is 4% of gifted enrollment. So as a recap to last year, the first year of the initiative, 69 elementary schools administered this screener to 7,353 second grade students. From this screener, we, a little bit over 1,300 rising third graders, were eligible to move forward in the evaluation process. The evaluation process includes a full IQ assessment as well as an observation, depending on plan A, plan B, and a matrix. We've also seen an increased teacher enrollment in our gifted endorsement coursework by 162% from the previous year. Some of the data chats that's come out of the school year 22. Our main issue is we're waiting on final numbers of students who pass the final IQ assessment. This is because the screener deadline drop date was at the end of May last year. When a student screens through, uh, parents give consent to assess, and then the district has 90 days to allow for that assessment. What we need to understand is that we are still in that 90-day assessment period, which will not end till the end of March. But what we do see in our data is that the screener benefited Plan A students in moving forward to assessment. Plan A students are students that are not considered low socioeconomic or EL students, English learner students. And our current data has a margin of error due to some double assessments, as well as the fact we are looking at the plan A and plan B differenti differentiation. I just wanna take a brief look of the school, yes. Do, do you want me to stop or? Okay, I apologize, thank you. I just wanna take a brief look at the school demographics of the school year 22 and the school year 23. The 69 original schools, and this is pulled from the 2020 GSI map. You can find this on the Palm Beach County School website. Um, and this is based on the 2020 uh, GIS because this is what was uh, presented to the board. We are looking at 69 original schools and the school population was 28% black. 30% white and 34 Hispanic. Our 20 new schools this year, their population are 35% black, 20% white and 39% Hispanic. We are inferring that the reason why we are seeing the plan A having more of a turnout is because the schools that were actually assessed in the first 69 are current gifted cluster sites. That means that they have gifted programs and they are in areas that are heavy gifted. Because of some of the issues we've seen in our data, we've actually changed the process this year. 
We update and stream training sessions. This year, our teacher professional development, as well as our ESE professional development, is streamlined to about the process and the purpose of the Naglieri. We've created a new timeline. I would love to have data in January of final assessments. This is also in conjunction with the school psych team. The new timeline will allow for them to understand their workload moving into the following year. It will also, also allow for parent consents to happen after spring break. And now the screener will be delivered between the progress monitoring um, windows. We have universal parent communication from the district level. Um, one of the surveys we put out, parents actually wanted an opt-out option. This is not something that will be delivered to parents, but it can be requested. We are limiting the access codes per school, where it's one per school instead of each teacher receiving an assessment access code. We are monitoring the assessment rosters at the district. Working closely with our ESE department, we will be pulling the names of students who are already gifted, have had a full IQ in the previous year, or have been screened in the previous year. And we are also making sure that all the collection and collation of initial screener data is at the district level. This is important as we move forward with understanding the numbers and our demographics. Currently in discussion in, on the team and in the department are our feeder and receiver schools. Part of the school board uh, program was to allow for schools to keep their gifted students. So those feeder schools will then become their own gifted populations. We are also really pushing out a marketing campaign of sorts to communicate to principals regarding teacher endorsements. Schools that are currently in our screening process should have a teacher, a third grade teacher enrolled in the gifted endorsement so they can provide services to their students that pass through the screener. We are looking at school-based support how can we provide streamlined support for enrichment, EPs, as well as gifted best practices and pedagogy? And we're really looking to rewrite the LEA guide to highlight specific gifted procedures, such as outlining what EL students are plan B, how the matrix plays into a role, and other items that have seemed to have miscommunication because of ambiguities. And that is all. Thank you so much for today. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I know there was a couple hands that went up, but you'll be able to help me in the um, room. Mr. Collins, do you have any questions at this time? You'll be help, able to help me with the online. Um, I think the first hand was Ms. Feldman, if I can see from where I'm at. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, could you go over what the timeline is? So is it that the second graders are screened at the beginning of the year or they're screened at the end of the year? So the timeline, we are currently in the process of purchasing the licenses. The screener will go out for students to be screened February um, the second to last week of February into that week before spring break. So there is a three and a half week window for schools to choose when they would cho screen their second graders. Okay, so they're screening the second graders in February, which means that if the student is then, uh, if the screening highlights that the student might be appropriate to be gifted, then the student would then take an IQ test and then, so that process of identif of actually having the child moved into the gifted program wouldn't happen possibly until the following March in third grade. Do I understand this correctly? So if the child screens through and the parent offers consent after spring break, the child will be placed in a gifted mixed class during their third grade year until they are actually identified as gifted. It is not a class they would be removed from from that year, but it is a placement process. So we can allow for that 90 day window and not penalize a child for the screener. Okay, and why is it that we wait until 
basically February um, to conduct the screening? Um, well, we have in conjunction with school psych, they are carrying their loads from last year's into the first semester. We need to kind of systematically tailor off that load of what is happening because school psych can't handle a workload of two second grade levels. Um, being that we st finalized assessments last year in May, we've had to push back just a little bit, even though we pushed up our calendar, um, to allow for the work, the school psych load that they're completing now. Okay, so when you say load, you mean just the sheer number of tests were too many? So it's being pushed back in time? Is that what you're trying, what you're Well, actually, we moved, we moved the timeline up this year. We moved it up to February. Last year, it was April and May. Okay, but why is it still in February instead of, for example, the beginning of the year? Um, progress monitoring, we didn't want the screener to interfere with the first two progress monitoring. So progress monitoring is in that first window, ends in September, and then it opens again in December. Thank you, Laura. Um, you said you had several other questions. Uh, we do have several hands up. Um, sure. um, and I, have, I have just one last one, which is how many schools are not doing the screening currently? Um, this year, there will be a total of 89 schools, and then we're adding next year the final schools, which are 17, if I'm correct. It's 17 or 18. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to recognize, is that Ms. McQuinn that I can see? <laughs> I want to it recognize <laughs> Ms. McQuinn. I'm so sorry. I cannot see from here. I'm looking for my glasses, but yeah, I no, saw I'm your sorry. smile and your hands um, were, your hands was raised. I am so delighted to, to finally be with Academic Advisory and I admit to I certainly pay attention at workshops, but I'm not as um, I'm not as familiar with the timeline and the process for identifying students for the gifted program in the third grade. But let me just ask you this. So I'm going to take a, a big picture because those of you who have been in the weeds know a lot more. But my question is, do we have, um, do we still need more teachers with gifted endorsement, number one? Yes. Okay, so my question there is, Dr. Sheffield, um, and or um, Ms. Rieger, do does the district pay for teachers to work toward their gifted endorsement? Yes, we do. Yay. All right. Okay. That's a, that's a great answer. And then finally, when we look at the workload that you're discussing, have we looked at recent retirees who um, could be brought in to assist with um, that testing, with that workload? That has not been discussed, and that is something that I definitely will take back to the team to discuss. I really appreciate that. And regarding the gifted endorsement classes, my uh, the acceleration team, we actually facilitate and teach those. So we offer them to our district personnel for free. That is great news. And really, let's, let's please do look at the... Um, at, at retirees, recent retirees, because you don't want to have to come up, get them up to snuff. But there are many who, you know, they've had it with teaching full time, but they might love to come in and do that. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, and uh, did I capture this correctly? You said the your pers the in-house personnel team offers and train um, staff for the gift. Okay. Thank you. And I think there's another name up there, Rachel. Rachel? Yes, I had two questions. My first question is um, kind of um, piggybacking off, off the last one. Uh, have you hired more school psychologists to do the testing? Because I know the um, children that might have learning disabilities also need to be tested, and it seems as if there's always a backlog for that. So um, how are you handling this? Um, IEPs take preference over EPs, that is state policy. So um, when the school psychologists are evaluating for something like that, that, you know, that is priority, they have their 60 day window. 
Um, what we are doing is we've worked closely with the school psych team. Um, we looked at the workload that they had come in for full psych evals from this actual um, program. We've worked closely with them to make this timeline and to speak to the ESE school-based coordinators about aligning lists of students, the types of lists, so that way this year what we're gonna do is after the consent meetings are held, we're going to probably shuffle some school psychs from school to schools to help out where the numbers are. So it was a learning curve that we've, we're really trying to correct moving forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that, that, that's good to hear because it, it does seem like a lot of testing has to get done. Now, my question is, I saw that there were three areas, verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative that you're assessing. What if a child shows a, you know, a strength in quantitative, but not so much in verbal? So they're gifted in one area and not the other. Does that child still continue in on the gifted track or is, or is it not considered? So, um, I'm sorry. How is that determination made? So the screener, unlike a full IQ exam, um, mm -hmm. gives us a total score. So the total score for plan B would be 112 to move forward to IQ and a total score for 120. We would not know the differentiation of what a child is actually gifted in until they do take that full psych exam and get specific scores for each element. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that could possibly eliminate a child that has you know, such a a, a gift in math, but maybe not verbally, and therefore is cut off from getting the more enriched math programs, or you don't see that as, as being an issue? Um, currently, I don't see that as being an issue, looking at the data from what the scores um, actually rain on the screener. I will be able to have those answers for you after we actually finish this 90-day cycle um, to look at the services that are currently being provided to the students that went through the screener last year and how they're actually progressing in, let's say, acceleration. And I understand your concern. My daughter loves reading, but is not well at math. So it's kind of navigating that gifted aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I just wanna clarify um, or get a little clarity on, Ms. Feldman had a question regarding the testing. Was the testing that's done in February or towards the end of February, was that because this is a, um, this is the first year or the second year that we're testing or going forward, that would be the time frame that uh, the second graders are tested? Based on feedback we've received from school psych, um, the ESE school-based coordinators, they actually recommended this be the testing window after experiencing it last year. We can always tweak it moving forward, but we really like input from the community. And we like to see what best fits their schedules also. If we can get that school buy-in, we see that testing go a little bit smoother and a little faster. And just for clarification purposes, the test is done, it is administrated in February, and from my understanding, that child will then be moved into, if they're identified as a, um, you know, if they, they pass this particular screener, they would be moved into a gifted mix after spring break or the following year? The following year, we would need parent consent first okay. before moving the child into a different spe specific class. So parent consent would happen after spring break Right. which would allow for scheduling to occur appropriately. Makes sense, so that child would then be able to be moved into um, yeah. gifted that following year, which makes sense because it takes much longer time if it was the regular, well, in the past, it, with my children going through this process, it have, take, um, have taken a much longer time um, to get my child to move into a um, gifted class even after being identified as a gifted student so the time frame is much shorter I can, I can attest to that with four different kids in different age brackets so could I just get a little bit of clarification so you're saying if the test is done in February and the parent consents then after spring break the child could move to a different class within that same school year no, it would be the third grade year. So the as a, year. so they're yes. finishing out the year with the students that they're familiar with. Correct. Yes. 
Okay, I, I do have another question, but I if other people have questions. No, I, I just want to chime in. This is Dr. Sheffield on that piece in regards to the how important it is. And I know once this child may have, you know, have met the criteria that for the screener to continue on with testing and so forth. And I'm angsting that some may think that, you know, we're moving so slow. But I think what's important to me, and I always say to the team, is that as we talk about in regards to um, making certain that we're doing what's right for children, I want to make certain that we also understand that we need to make certain that we are training up our teachers around the instructional pedagogy and that they have those necessary tools and the understanding so that when the student is indeed placed there with the, with the teachers with the expectation that we've done a great job and we're continuing to provide the ongoing support for the teachers because that's, that's, cru that's, that's crucial mm -hmm. because we can have the students but if we're not taking time in looking at our adult learners and being intentional about providing that support, then it could be also be doing a disservice to the kids. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, you said you had another question? Yeah, actually a couple. Okay. Um, so, so Dr. Sheffield, so in that light, let's say in February, um, 50% of the class has screened, the whole class has screened and 50% of those students um, are earmarked and the the meaning and the parents have given consent for the child to be put into the third grade mixed gifted class. Then, <clears throat> what is done for the last trimester basically uh, for those students as they are in their current second grade class? Would there need to be some other support given to the teacher to help the teacher understand how better to possibly meet these students needs because they've screened the way they have i realize that the gifted designation has not been determined yet mm -hmm. but you've got students have been identified as possibly being there do those teachers then need um, more support to help meet those students needs in second grade so one of the reasons why the schools, the first round of universal screener was completed at the district cluster sites is because there is gifted, there are gifted teachers in every grade level. Um, we have been providing enrichment lessons to schools that are working on the gifted. We've actually, we have a full calendar for February to go into the schools to offer enrichment, which that's what gifted is. It's, it's really an enrichment ideology to the schools that are new on our screener list this year. So that way the okay. teachers will be able to teach enrichment and they'll also be able to register for the gifted courses beginning for the spring session. Okay, but and just to be clear, gifted means both, there are students who need both enrichment and advancement and some need one and some need the other. There are students for which they, they do need acceleration approaches, accelerated, that's what I meant. Yes, yeah, so not all gifted students should be accelerated and not all accelerated students are gifted, right? So right. being gifted is a pedagogy and a style of instruction. So it's really about getting the teachers along the line of pedagogy and understanding the differentiation skills and strategies to be able to teach each child and uh, award their EP goals. Okay, great. Um, so my next question is is with this screening what changes have you seen in terms of the demographics of the students enrolled within the gifted program and then i have two more questions after this currently it's been very similar to what we had last year because as i stated earlier the first 69 schools were gifted cluster sites so the schools um, were based in predominantly upper class areas um, around the circle of our district um, versus the areas where we see a lot of our el students or our low socioeconomic students so we're hoping this year um, to increase that as we decrease the amount of population of the plan A students and increase our plan B population. I see, okay. Um, I 
just blanked on one of my questions. Okay, so um, one one question is, um, and I realize that this is focusing on screen. How are we handling the fact that there are some students who are having their um, gifted evaluation done privately, and so they start within the gifted program within kindergarten, and how is that working with the students who are coming in at, uh, beginning third grade? Um, the students who have private evals and clear the observation in kindergarten are placed in a gifted mix. The students who screen through in second grade will be placed with a gifted mix in third grade. We can't go backwards, and it's, that's, it's Florida policy um, how we honor that. Okay, is there information or something that the students are missing because they have didn't have those gifted lessons, you know, those enriched lessons in kindergarten, first and second grade? No, most of our kindergarten, first and second grade teachers and uh, do understand enrichment um, and understand how to compound curriculum because it is a class by class base and um, they'll get that enrichment in their small reading groups. They'll get that enrichment in their pullouts. So I, I don't see a difference. Um, it's just having the teacher being certain that they are placed with a teacher who has gifted certification or is currently in the class. So if I understand correctly, you're saying basically the elements of the education are the same, whether they're in the gifted class or they're not in the gifted class. The only difference is the training of the teacher? No, that's not what I meant. I apologize. But in the school system in kindergarten and first grade, our teachers do circle like round tables. They do small group pullouts. There is the teachers do understand the difference between enrichment and remediation. With gifted pedagogy, it's more enrichment. And what you'll see is those students who are gifted will be more hands-on and oftentimes teachers will pick up on that. Did that clarify? Kind of, but um, I mean, I would hope that the screening is identifying students who are not already identified by a teacher as being gifted. No, we do not screen students who are currently gifted or students who are currently going through the gifted um, Right, but that, that wasn't where I was going. Yes. Because what you're basically saying is the students, students who are not originally in the gifted program in kindergarten, first and second grade. So those students, if they needed enrichment, they should get enrichment and then that would be the same enrichment that the gifted students are receiving. But the screening then later identifies them to then be placed with a teacher who's trained to work with gifted students specifically. Is that correct? Yes, because each student has different needs. So, okay. I mean. So, but my question is, so those students who need enrichment and got enrichment without identi being identified as gifted, that's great but i would imagine part of the benefit of having the screening is that there are students who for whatever reason might be the teacher didn't pick up on the fact that the student needs mm -hmm. that a, approach that happens with gifted education whether it's enrichment or compacting the curriculum or whatever it may be and so this child was not identified prior to this and did not get that special enrichment coming up but now the screening has said, hey, hello, this child passes the screening in a way that indicates that the child might be gifted, but the child didn't get that specific that specific help going along in their education. How are we working? Is it just that we're just gonna say, well, from this point forward, we're going to work and give that kid the enrichment that they need? Or how, is there any information, any learning that this child has now missed out on because they were able to sort of swim under the radar, so to speak. Go ahead and answer, and then um, we do have another hand up, Laura, and we no will have a hard stop on this conversation at 6.30 because uh, we want to be respectful of the, um, of the present or speaker's time. So every student, whether they're gifted or not, has a set of benchmarks and standards that they are required to learn. With that being said, and I think what you're asking is why is this screener not earlier than second grade? 
And I, I think that's what I'm hearing, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I think that is an element of it, so yes. Okay, so one of the theory behind putting it in second grade is it's no longer nature versus nurture, and that students have had an opportunity to balance out. We have found that students leave first grade with their ability to read, and second grade was what the board and our previous committee chose on because it balances out in second grade. Now, after the three years, this is definitely something we can go back and revisit, but we have to finish the three-year cycle that was approved, and this is a great discussion to bring back to the team as to why isn't it earlier. So thank you very much for pointing that out, and I definitely will bring that back to look at. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Sherelle, you're um, acknowledged. Oh, okay. Thank you. So in the beginning or around your statement, you said that there were only 89 classes or not 80, schools. 89 schools that were going to be tested. And then you added more this year, right? Is, is that a correct statement? We started with 69. We added 20 more this year and we're finishing next year with 18. Right. And so you said because of the, I guess, the way they were scoring in low, you said social areas, is that correct? Is that is that what you said? No, I said the demographics for the schools that we tested at were already gifted cluster sites. Um, mm -hmm. They are more in plan A area, which is more affluent areas. The second, because they are the gifted sites, that's where the tested started. So we are seeing now that the moving, where we're moving to in the second and third phase of this, we are actually hitting a different demographic. We're looking more at EL students, which is your plan B student, as well as a lower socioeconomic based on free and reduced lunch data. Okay. All right. And so in total, how many, how many schools will it be? This year, 89. 89. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there a possibility that we can have the um, list of schools, the 89 schools, and addition to the 17 schools that will come about next year? Um, yes, I'll forward program. that to Dr. Sheffield to forward. Thank you. Thank you. And then I had one last question as we take off. The question that I have, or I don't know if it's a question or a concern, um, one of the things that I've noticed with gifted, um, gifted high achieving mixed classes is that um, when there is a concern for after the, is it 11 day count? I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator. So I think that 11 day count, when there's an issue with the 11 day count, the first, if your child is um, in the gifted high achieving mix and there's a concern with, um, with the numbers per se, the first kids that get to go back to the general population and I have my little air here. Um, I'm, I'm throwing my little air fingers up, right? And, I, and you can correct me with the terms. Um, the first students that goes back and they're, they, they go back to the general population class in order to fulfill those numbers. Um, for example, if they're losing a teacher for, let's say, third grade, um, those students who are gifted will go into the gifted class. Those students who are not gifted will have to go back to the general pop class um, or general population. And I just want to know how are we rectifying or how do we, how are we preparing or being proactive to rectify those concerns? Because I know I've seen it firsthand at our school and parents have asked me to advocate and I just have to give them to the next person who can advocate for themselves. I mean, who can advocate for them. But um, yeah, how, how are we being proactive with that? That's a phenomenal question. I like your air quote terms. I'm going to use that because it's much friendlier. Um, basically, the push out of the gifted endorsement classes, we're really trying to make sure that there are teachers at every grade level from kindergarten through fifth grade that are gifted endorsed. Um, if you noticed, 160% to 162% increase in that gifted enrollment is definitely a good step there. Um, we actually have a new enrollment coming out in three weeks, so we should understand the population, the continuation of it. 
as long as a teacher, according to Florida policy, is in the gifted endorsement program, they are able to have a gifted mixed class. So what we're seeing is we're working a lot with principals to make sure that there is some alignment of gifted te teachers who are either gifted endorsed or are currently going through the program with the district. Thank you. Um, is there a way, because we're data driven, right? Um, is there, and, and this will be the last question because it's 630 and I want to be respectful of what I stated. Um, is there a way to share the numbers of teachers that are going, or staff that's going through the gifted endorsement um, program at this time? The total number of teachers in yes. the five classes? That have went through and currently, or that's going through. I'll stop that going through. The so program. how many gifted endorsement teachers we have in right. the district Versus as well as how, how many, many are currently through the program? Yeah, that's correct. We can, we can look that data up for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank your presentation. You. Um, and I think I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, so just to recap, I guess the ask is that the number of gifted teachers that we currently have and then the number of teachers that are participating in the cohort. That's correct. And as well as the um, a listing of the schools. Of the schools. Mm -hmm. okay. That's currently in the program mm -hmm. and the 18 that will be in the program next year. Okay. Thank you. We will provide that. And um, because you're here to present to us, I also want to ask you, is there anything that you need from this body and this committee um, at this time? I appreciate the constant support and the constant questions to push us further into looking deeper at what we can do better for the community and our students. So that's that's what I'm asking for. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Dr. Sheffield. Okay, thank you, Ms. Baruch. Um, and again, thank you, team, um, for the, the engagement and the conversations around the work that we're doing. And at this time, I'll turn it over to our Chief of HR, Mrs. Rieger, and uh, Mrs. Elaine Gallinger. Hi everyone, thank you so much for allowing us to be here to present to you this afternoon, evening. Um, we're excited to share the initiatives and programs that we have in place to address, as Dr. Sheffield mentioned earlier, uh, we're in a very challenging climate right now for recruitment and retention. It's a national issue, um, not just facing our district, but districts all across the country. So we, ha we do have some exciting programs in place and some initiatives that have been underway that we wanted to share with you so you can see um, the, not only the strategy, but some of the details within the programs that we have in place to address this issue. Um, it's helpful to start off uh, with looking at our overall strategy and the model that we follow here at the district. Um, the model that we follow, the system that we have in place, really utilizes best practices. And it's, as you can see, it's a year-round program. It's not just a one-and-done type initiative. We start off looking at data. We, uh, we gather information. We gather information about our, our recruitment needs. Um, what are our turnover statistics? Where are our vacancies? That helps us really design our, our strategy. Um, and then we put our programs in place, and it doesn't just stop there. We really analyze the programs to see what's working, what tweaks we need to make, and what other programs might be needed to help address our recruitment and retention initiatives. Um, it's a multi-stakeholder program and system. Our stakeholders include our principals, principal supervisors, um, unions, associations, our staff, you know, even the Department of Education, as well as our HR partners. Um, Ms. Gallagher will talk about our HR partner model shortly, but um, those are really the stakeholders that we, we have for our program. It's multi-channel. Um, we, we try to utilize different avenues, different platforms, different programs um, for both recruitment and retention. Um, it's relationship-driven. Our HR partner model is really dependent on the relationships, and um, we make sure that our HR partners really build those relationships to increase communication, to make sure that our stakeholders know that we have, um, there is a place for them to go. Our principals have a resource, and we're providing the tools that are necessary for our principals to be um, the most effective human capital leaders that they can be. 
Um, it's also equity driven. We have a component for equity within our programs. We are looking at our programs through an equity lens, making sure that our most in need schools have access to effective teachers and our programs are really driven by that equity lens that we have in place. Um, so that's our overall strategy. Ms. Gallagher, is, uh, she leads this strategy. Her and her team do an amazing job at putting these programs in place. And I am going to turn it over to Ms. Gallagher to talk about some of the specifics within the programs. So one of the first things that we do when we think about recruitment, um, we have lots of different um, sources and ways for us to recruit teachers and recruit instructional personnel for our schools. And one of the main things that we do is we do our own events. We do sponsor a job fair each and every year. Um, and we do specific recruitment and certification chats. Certification is where our retention piece comes in and we keep all our instructional personnel informed and supported in certification so that they can renew and acquire their certification credentials in a timely manner. And then we also do these chats to ensure that our community, all stakeholders, all the channels have availability to information about us and who we are as an employer um, for teachers. We also do some self-sponsored events. We've done a lot of research as to where our teachers come from. We do employ about 13,000 of them, right? And we hire lots of them every year. So we review that data every year to take a look at where are the majority of our teachers coming from. And honestly, the majority of our teachers come from Florida, of course. They are local teachers, but we do have a second set that we need to make sure that we're always accessing. And so we do very focused self-sponsored events in very particular spaces because we look at that data and we analyze to make sure that we're gathering teachers from those specific places. We all know here in Palm Beach County, we are a little bit of Southern New York and we have a lot of connections with New York in the tri-state area. So we do a lot of focused recruitment in that area, knowing that there's always some sort of connection for folks when they come here to Palm Beach County with New York. And so we do recruitment there. We also have a very high need to recruit bilingual and diverse teachers in all areas for all our schools. And so we do a very focused effort in a Puerto Rico um, recruitment event that we do strategize around every single year. We also, of course, of high importance are our university partnerships and relationships. And so I've put on there the logos of all these local universities that we work with. We certainly work beyond that and we work with universities around the Eastern Seaboard, but our local Florida universities are really our main contact for those, not just education majors that are coming to our schools, but also we've now in this new environment, we are looking at people who are graduating with psychology degrees and want to teach social studies or they're graduating with a business degree and want to teach computer education in our schools. And so we're looking and being a lot more creative about these graduates from these universities coming into our classrooms and teaching our students as well with their expertise. Some other things that we've done creatively in the last year specifically, and so last year we had a contract approved with Educational Partners International. This allows us to then hire teachers that have a J-1 visiting teacher visa, and they're here for three years from all over the world, and we're so like pleased with this program. This is the first year that we've had these teachers on board. They, uh, we hired 45 teachers. They are all at 18 of our schools. Um, we are looking to kick off hiring for these teachers on February 1st. We have teachers here from Colombia. We have teachers here from Africa. We have teachers here from Honduras. We have teachers here from Spain. We have teachers here from Jamaica. So it's really diversifying our teaching force and it's bringing some really great talent into our schools. The other thing that's happening too, some of our Title I schools have been recognized by the state for needing additional support and so what this has done is create an incentive for teachers who have who are highly effective and have certain VAM scores according to the state to be able to teach at these schools and receive a supplement allocation and if you can see here I've noted that they can see receive up to $7,500 a year 
for a certain score. And then the other teachers can also receive, I, I believe it, $15,000 a year for getting a highly effective in a certain score. We have a total of seven schools in this program. So it's a great program that allows these particular schools that are very high needs to be staffed with the most and the best teachers that we possibly have. So that's a really great program supporting um, some of our highest need schools. The other thing that we do is we make sure we stay up to date with the latest and greatest in virtual recruitment. Very important in this time and very important in this age. And so we've um, engaged in contract with several platforms, one of them being Career Fair Plus, which is a job fair and also recruitment platform that we use for general and customized recruitment events. We've been able to host events for a particular school or for a group of schools or a district-wide event through that platform. We also just recently engaged with contract with Handshake. Handshake is a platform that is engaged with colleges and universities nationwide, allows us to post positions within their platform, source applicants from their platform, and also manage hiring events with their platform. And so it's a, it's a great contract that we're in. We also use a platform called Spark Hire to do some interviews and screenings. <clears throat> this is a video link that an applicant can access, record an interview, I can send that interview to a principal and right away create a connection in order for them to have a good high quality hire. And we also use another platform called S'mores to communicate with our applicant force so we keep an applicant pool, an email listing that we continuously and constantly communicate with, letting them know what our openings are, when we have job postings at particular schools, what our needs are so that applicants are always in informed on when and how to apply to our school postings. The other program that we have that's really great and I'm super proud of this program and love talking about this program, our Teacher Ambassador Program is in 17 of our Title I schools specifically. It is a career pathway for a teacher leader on that campus. They are a teacher who is identified through a list of criteria that they must meet and are part of the leadership team of that campus. The main piece of for this teacher is that they are a coordinator of onboarding services for that particular school. They're a mentor to the mentors of teachers on that particular school. They're on the interview committee, they attend job fairs, and they collaborate with other teacher leaders to support the teachers of that school. It's a great retention initiative. And what's unique about these teachers is that they receive support and training from our HR team. So it is not necessarily training on working with students on student achievement, it's actually training in supporting the adults and the teachers that are supporting those students. It's training in supporting their school staff in ensuring that students are doing as well as possible via the teachers. And so when these teachers are being supported, they're looking at things like the turnover data for their schools, they're looking at our applicant tracking, sy tracking system, they're getting specific training on recruitment and retention strategy for their particular schools. They participate in cohorts and receive training in applying equity embedded tools in managing human capital. We also have our HR partner model of support to support our schools and we have five HR partners that are designated specifically for our schools. They are a one-stop shop for our principals and so our principals have a huge burden of and a huge amount of priorities that they have to manage. And so we wanna lessen that burden for them by making sure that they have a one-stop shop, one point of contact to ensure that all their HR needs and any other needs are taken care of. So my principals will call on their HR partner for anything and everything having to do with HR. The HR partner will then ensure that they're connected with whatever service they might need. And so it, we also have empowered our principals principles with a huge tool and that's data and so we've empowered them with a dashboard that has human capital data very comprehensive data tools for them to make real and on-time decisions they can make future decisions and they can review past 
and um, historical data in order to make those future decisions. So that HR partner development module that we offer, our partners are consistently also participating in training and supports from other agencies in order to then best support our principals. But the main tool that we want to support them with and that we're consistently utilizing is that HCM dashboard that we call it. And we, um, guide the principals in making some great decisions regarding their staff in order to increase their student achievement on their campuses. So there's not a one size fits all approach to human capital. So our um, HR partners are using that relationship driven approach to ensure they're developing great, consistent and strong relationships with their principals, really getting to know those particular schools in order to meet the needs of those particular schools. The other initiative that I wanted to make sure to mention today is our principal network. We've been working with um, the Urban Schools Human Capital Academy for about five to six years now. And every year they offer us an opportunity to expand our services to our schools and expand our work in supporting the work of human capital management. We know that research says that the principal is the most important human capital, the biggest influence in student achievement next to the teacher. And so we want to be sure that our principals are very well supported in that work. We've now engaged um, Ushka, I'll call them, USHCA, to run a principal network with 15 of our Title I schools. They're doing monthly sessions with them on specific human capital topics that include things like assessing their current status, and then they're gonna take action steps based on that. So I listed some of the topics that they're working on here. They worked on them based on like the theme of the month. So way back in September when we started the network, they were working on the new teacher experience. They've already done some work for workforce planning. Right now they're working on new teacher retention and are gonna to move towards some scheduling for student equity discussions. They're gonna work on distributing teacher leadership. Those are great retention initiatives um, and those kinds of things. So 15 schools are participating this year. We hope to expand that to more schools for next year. Those are just a summary of some of the initiatives that we engage in. We actually engage in a lot more than that, but I would have taken a lot of your time this evening and we wanted to kind of summarize what we do to support your schools. So thank you for your attention this evening. We hope this is helpful information for you. Thank you. And I think I still see Sherelle's hand. Was that from the previous presentation, Sherelle, or is that a new request? Oh, no, that's from the previous. I'm sorry. Not a problem. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Gallagher? And did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, or Ms. Rieger on the HR update. Um, Laura, then Rachel. Well, well, actually, let, Rachel can go before me. I spoke a lot before. Um, I have a question because I know in a lot of other career, um, a lot of other professions, you know, you have internships or, and I know that there's student teaching. Um, and I know that we are near FAU, but there are, you know, so many great schools in Florida. Um, how do you think it would help or are we already doing this to have more, you know, student teachers? Because once you get hit them here to experience the Palm Beach County school system, maybe they would actually stay and want to be, you know, a teacher in our school district. Um, is that a method that you use a lot? Is it, you know, I have absolutely not seen too many student, you know, student we teachers. Act, we actually right. already do that. We host student teachers from all over Florida. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can add to that. Um, we have about 17 schools and universities that we have affiliation agreements with to be able to provide um, not only interns, but students even prior to their internship come over for field observations, um, hundreds every semester. Um, interns, we have about 65 interns every semester that come to us uh, for those programs. So yes, mm -hmm. it is something that it's very effective and that's a great point. Um, it's very effective for us to recruit from that particular pool. We have a very high recruitment rate from that group that comes through. Mm -hmm. Losing my voice. Great. Miss mm -hmm. Rieger and Miss Gallinger, um, hopefully I'm not speaking out of line, but I'm, I'm excited 
You know, I know uh, Ms. Jones has been working with um, Dr. Johnson mm -hmm. um, with Choice as we are looking at bringing, revitalizing what we call Grow Our Own mm -hmm. um, to where, you know, we have our early childhood programs here in the district. And there was back in a time, Mr. Collins, I'm taking you way back, <laughs> um, where we used, and Ms. McQuinn, you probably remembered, where the students that we had participating in our teacher academies, those students were offered like what I think it was non-binding um, contracts and they went away, they successfully completed their four years, teacher certification, everything came back and they had their jobs here in Palm Beach County. And I can tell you many of those students because I participated in the ceremonies, there are still teachers here in the district and have done exceptionally well. And I'm just excited that we are bringing we're continuing the collaboration um, and looking to see how do we um, bridge that gap. So I'm just excited about it. Our Grown Our Own initiative is so expansive and so broad. It would have been a presentation all on its own. And I did not, I'm, I'm sorry I did not include it here, but it is quite expansive. We are doing many different channels within our Grow Our Own initiative. So we are looking at growing our own employees, paraprofessionals, um, school behavioral health professionals, um, all kinds of professionals to grow into teaching as well as our K-12 students to grow into teaching. And so that's a whole separate presentation to be honest because it, it needs that kind of time and effort and attention. Um, but it is a huge piece of our recruitment and retention initiatives here for Palm Beach County Schools. Well, I just want you to know it works and I just, <laughs> I just could not let you um, let you ladies come tonight <laughs> and not mention it because it's something that I know work and I see the, the fruit of the labor in these, they're adults now. Um, and it's just so exciting. Now with the, just along those same lines, right, with the growing your own, um, how are we assisting those that's coming back? They may leave for four years and they're coming back with housing, with the housing crisis right now. How are we um, assisting those students that leave and then come back and are met with <laughs> what we call right now the housing, the housing well, crisis. The good thing of it is, and I'm sure I'm not taking over HR, you can tell I'm just excited, but a good part of the growing your own is that many of them come back to their families. You know, their families are here, so they're able to come back and, you know, they're with mom, dad, relatives, you know, yeah, while they, they are, you know, while they're building, you know, building themselves professionally, but I'll let them talk more about it. But that's one of the benefits that I get as I continuously talk to the students. Well, and Dr. Sheffield is right. Those students who are coming back to us are coming back to resources, family, connections that they have already here. The housing crisis is very real for anyone who's relocating here in Palm Beach County. And so it is definitely something that we have our eye on. Not always do we have the financial resources to be able to assist with something like that. That's not something our dis school district is prepared to do at this point. But we do work with connecting them with as many resources as we can outside of the school district in order to get assistance. Um, and with those, go, uh, Laura, I'll let you, go. well, I'm gonna, I just wanna finish because I don't wanna, she brought yeah, in course. that part. With the housing, um, have we looked into partnerships with the, high, uh, with the colleges? Not too long ago did I go back to school and graduated from FAU, and I remember when I was at FAU uh, where I studied interdisciplinary studies, we did uh, extensive research on housing, right? And so one of the things were affordable housing and um, building affordable housing for professionals, such as those teachers that would come back or other professions in industries that would come back. Have we looked at um, those affordable houses that we think that our teach or our um, college dorms, but they're actually affordable housings for industry professionals? young y industry professionals? Yes, we have looked at that. Um, part of the issue is that colleges locally are having the same issue. Yes. Their dorms are <laughs> overrun right now. Um, our board has asked us to look into affordable housing and we are um, meeting internally our leadership team to look at are there any options as a district that we can um, work towards to help because we do know it's a big issue and it's 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 a large issue for mm -hmm. not only our visiting teachers from you know our, our, our other countries but also our local and, and relocating um, professionals so it is an issue and it's a great point we are looking into it to see if there's anything we can do more of as a district but um, yeah thank you 
Okay. Um, Ms. Feldman? So <clears throat> to kind of piggyback on what you were talking about with the Grow Your Own, plus adding in my other question that I'll, I'll ask is that, um, has there been thought to implementing something along the line? Because as I understand it, it's difficult to find, for example, physics teachers and perhaps some math teachers, upper level math teachers for high school and um, other, there, there are certain topics that might be more difficult to find than others, whether it's AP economics or other things like that. Have we considered um, offering grow your own uh, opportunities to students who are focusing their high school studies on particular subjects like the sciences or math in order to help us grow our own science and math teachers? Our grow our own opportunities for students are for all areas of teaching and so we start actually as early as elementary school with teachers of tomorrow clubs and programs that moves into Florida Future Educators of America and so we're actually um, honing in on not just are you interested in teaching elementary? We're honing in on, are you interested in teaching math? Are you inter interested in teaching economics? We also do a lot of work with ensuring that they know and understand they don't absolutely have to have that education degree. If they're looking for an English degree, if they're looking for an economics degree, if they're looking for a math degree or physics degree, letting them know and working with them to understand that teaching is still a part of that and can be a profession that can be acquired through those types of degrees. So the answer to that is yes, but it's a little more complicated as you're working with the students to help them understand that piece as we grow our own. So are you offering it only through those um, teacher interest clubs, for lack of a better phrasing of those titles of future teachers, or are you informing all students about this possibility? Right now, our program is designed through those clubs and all of that. Can it be socialized and communicated district-wide? Absolutely. And so that is something that we're working on through those clubs and through all of that, those opportunities. We also do something like go to college, the college and university fairs that are offered to our K-12 students and our choice fairs that are offered to our K-12 students so that we can help students understand that we are an employer as well. We're not just teaching them and helping to educate them, but we're also an employer and an opportunity for them all together as they graduate from high school. So working with our, also our adult education programs in the same manner. Mm -hmm. It just might be helpful to, um, I can certainly understand the reasoning behind pushing this through the teacher oriented clubs and interest clubs, but perhaps it might be a good idea to also give more information to, for example, the math honor society and the various uh, science honor society um, elements as well. Uh, sure. Clubs, because that could really, you know, just so that someone says, oh, yes, I could have a job in this and let me go forward and then I know where I, where I can be. Absolutely. And they might not think of it because uh, off the top of their head, their main focus might not be teaching. It might be the subject, but this helps them show that they can use a subject in a way that helps benefit our community. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Feldman. Ms. McQuinn, you're recognized. Yeah, th I, thank you. Um, I wanted to say that the district did, through Ms. Rieger's office, implement I, right out of high school, they can be eligible to substitute teach. Mm -hmm. And I know of one young man who um, was in an entrepreneurship academy, certainly sports management, was not at all interested in teaching, but he was excited about being able to earn some money substitute teaching while he went on to um, FAU. Mm -hmm. And he wants to be a teacher now. So that's another way that number one, we're helping with the substitute situation, but we're also letting other kids know that you can do this as a side. I did that. I never dreamed of being a teacher, but I was, I was a substitute teacher and I said, this is what I'm born to do. So I do agree with reaching. I, I talked to Ms. Rieger 
oh, about a year ago. And as we have this Thank a Teacher program where different schools nominate um, teachers for recognition, I have met the most incredible um, new teachers. And having them go talk to, I love the idea of the, the advanced economics and a AP English, whatever, um, calculus classes, to talk to them about opportunities, the reason they came into education and get them excited. So yeah, I like that idea too, to, um, to target some of those other classes because they, they, they're very valuable to us. And I know Dr. Sheffield way back in our day, we, we did bring in, um, I'm going to, from other fields and we literally helped them get their teaching certification. So I think this grow your own thing is pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Any additional questions? I had one question around um, the slide regarding where uh, the recruitment process was, the recruitment e uh, efforts and initiatives. Um, I wanted to, I guess, ask one, of course, I'm all about schools to see which schools are we talking about where 45 um, teachers on board at 18 schools, um, part of the EPI. Uh, so just requesting the schools because I like to see, have a visual. And then the second question was um, for the countries that we have um, had part of this process, was Haiti considered a, um, one of the countries seeing that we have a great population of Haitians and we continue to? So see Educational that? Partners International are the connection to the countries okay. and the teachers. They're available to all countries around the world. And so okay. teachers from anywhere can apply to their program be vetted to their, through their program to get a, that J-1 visa to work with us. Okay. So we don't necessarily choose the countries ourselves, but we do get to see, we get to request and say, we'd love to see teachers from this country. Haiti was actually one of the first countries we requested teachers from. We just didn't happen to have, to have any teachers that we could pick from from Haiti at this okay. time. Okay. But it's still a constant request for us. And then the other question that I have is, do we have, um, a breakdown, I guess, by race and by male or female or gender um, of the teachers that are coming from this program internationally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we get that, mm -hmm. please? And I say we because I can ask for it, but I want collectively the committee to see the data as well. And we're, um, we're about to also begin our next process for next school year hiring with EPI. Um, there's an information session coming up that principals were made aware of today. Mm -hmm. And also uh, there'll be virtual hiring events at the end of this month. So we're starting very early in the recruitment process this year for the next school year. Thank you. And then the last question I had was um, regarding the recruitment process. I, I, can imagine that you're not just recruiting for teachers but other areas in the district so given that in January um, or I'm sorry have in the past I have a friend who works in the Bell Glade area and um, they've done events for seniors well by January February if the seniors haven't applied for any colleges you kind of got an idea that they might college might not be their path and this body along with um, the teachers in that area have done a job fair for students right out of high school and I've seen how successful it was whether it was intern whether it was jobs is there any um, intentions of doing that around other areas of the district for those students like I mean I have a foundation we do that for our kids right if you haven't applied for college or you don't know your path we do a little college we give interns we but is there a plan to do that for the south region the central region and the north region yes and that that's awesome because that's where you can possibly get your um you know some of the sfs crew or employment so just want to sfs for those who don't aware is the um, lunch room and school food school service. Food serv yeah, <laughs> I couldn't think of it. Um, but um, the school food service is another area. So just an opportunity and wanted to see if that was something that would come to this area or south and other areas. Yes. That's all I had. Thank you so much for your presentation. And just as we um, extended that um, invitation, is there anything you want from this committee um, for the HR? 
We appreciate the support, the questions. We are a great employer. We are the largest employer in Palm Beach County, offer great benefits and a great calendar. Competitive salaries with other school districts, and we're very proud of that. And so we're all recruiters in this room. We're all um, advertisers for Palm Beach County. So uh, we appreciate that support. Absolutely, thank you. And um, thank you at this time. I will hand, I think, for final words um, for new business and the progress updates from both uh, Gifted Acceleration and Human Resources. I'll let Dr. Sheffield end with final words. All right, well, thank you. And again, I just want to thank um, Ms. Rieger, uh, Ms. Gallinger, and Mrs. Baruch. You could see, um, you know, Many times there is a lot of noise and we don't hear about the great work that is happening within our system. Um, and we're not, definitely not saying that we are perfect, but what we do identify is that those opportunity, those growth, growth opportunities, I call it, and in regards to what is it that we're doing um, to continuously close those opportunities. So you could see that we have an awesome team here and your feedback, um, your questions, your engagement just help us dig deeper um, and continue to mitigate some of those pieces that's going to help us do the right thing for our our students and our adult learners so thank you um all three ladies to look tonight definitely appreciate you all coming out tonight to share the work that you, you and your team is doing thank you for having us and thank you so much as we prepare to end the night with um 10 minutes left on the clock um at this time i will entertain any questions from the committee um Mr. Collins, any questions or words? I was going to ask, um, is there anything uh, that can be done to uh, assist um, people that are currently in, in, in employed with the school district uh, that really want to become teachers? Their, 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 their issue is the, the test. And is the district, does the district have anything that they, if they do, how do you get that to the schools so that, so that the, the, um, the prospective people know that there is some help in terms of helping them to deal with the, uh, the testing program? The reason why I said it is because I have a son that works at uh, Palm Beach Central. He's been there for quite some time and a uh, bright youngster. But in the same token, I, I don't know whether he's fearful of not taking the test. I don't know whether he doesn't, have, he, he doesn't communicate that, that with me as much. So I, that's why I asked that question. So our certification exams are certainly, the Florida State certification exams are certainly very, very challenging and have become more challenging in recent years. And our teachers have needed a lot of support yeah, in passing those exams. And so we do offer assistance um, in helping um, our adult education program offers courses that um, you can access to, to help and study for those exams. We offer resources and study guides. Palm Beach State College offers some of that. On our web our certification webpage is full of those resources, and our certification department is certainly there to support anyone who will ask for those resources and we can provide them for them. So they, they really should come and ask instead of actually, um, okay. Yes, and and yes, I, sir. I mentioned the, um, the housing thing. Those are two things, as far as I'm concerned, that affect your, your, your teachers. Mm -hmm. Is any collaboration being done with the, uh, the county uh, to assist? Uh, that's something you probably could look, at, look into because that becomes crucial. You got youngsters that, and I, I mentioned, you said about parents, and that's, that's fine, but a lot of times the kids don't want to stay with their parents once they get out of college. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, they want to be on their own, so now, then housing becomes a, 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 an issue. I, I'm always, I'm realistic. I, I try to be realistic as much as possible. So, so that's something that maybe you might want to look into with the uh, Palm Beach County, the ho with the county to look at housing because that becomes a, a problematic issue in terms of recruitment and, and, and retention with those, with those youngsters. And that is a great point. And I, I don't want to speak for Mr. Boggess, our, our Chief of Staff, he's been working with the county and participating on some work groups as well, um, and he's bringing that information to us as we work on looking at affordable housing and what we can do. That's a great point, and I know that he is uh, looking into that as well. Yeah. 
Mr. Thank Collins, you. I'll, um, yeah, two great points you raised, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna ask um, Ms. Rieger, mm -hmm. and Elaine, um, if they'll just stay behind and they could get you that information. Okay. Um, and I also know that there are times, I know CTA used to also put on, um, yes, okay, they still put it on. I know CTA also puts on the workshops that helps with those um, certification exams, but we'll stay behind and make sure you get that information. And for those certification exams, our, um, our current um, named them, substitutes, mm -hmm. do they have access to those certification um, exams on, or the certification portal on the district? Uh, sure, on our end. Okay. And I, are we tapping into them? I, I'm, I'm sure we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're yes. actually now become eligible for FFEA program and can receive FFEA scholarship money in order to get their degrees. That's awesome. Um, and last but not least, do we, how many teacher um, programs or, I remember when I was in school back in 2005, we had early childhood program and I got my cert certificate from early childhood. Do we have that opportunity for teachers? Not necessarily their certifications because that is state based, but going through like a teacher program. How many schools that we have that currently have like a teacher's program? You're referencing a teacher academy for K-12 Like a teacher academy, yeah. For our K-12 students. Is that what you're referencing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We'll need to get that number from Choice. Yeah. That's at our okay. Choice office. Yeah, okay, so if we can come back with that, because just to see a comparison of um, how many students are going through the Teachers Academy and the recruitment process, um, how many are being, you know, whether they're applying or being recruited directly from the program. I'd love to. Yeah. I will, when I follow up with the numbers, I'll also send um, what I neglected to include on here was our graphic on our grow expansive, very, um, extensive grow our own program and mm -hmm. i will send dr sheffield that graphic as well and it has every single pathway and pipeline for our grow our own program thank you so much thank you what, again what, what, I, do you do you do you guys direct uh potential teachers to specific schools or do you allow them to select where they want to go i, I asked that question because having i'm trying to find a nice way to say this Having, having been a principal at, at a school that high energy, I use that word, um, sometimes uh, the district will direct potential teachers to other places and then uh, that those schools become secondary and, and as a result of that, they, they, they get a good experience at one school and they just stay there. So my, that, that's, that's my question. It's a complicated answer yeah, because well. As you know, we're an autonomous district and our principals have the authority and the autonomy to hire who they want on their teams, as they should. However, our current environment is what we call a buyer's market. Yeah. There is a lot of choice right now. And our teacher applicants can choose to go from wherever they would like. They can choose their school. And something that probably five, seven years ago was not really an option. They didn't have as much choice. Today, they can pretty much choose whichever school they want to go to and get a position at that school. And so as an HR partner and recruitment team, we, what we do is prioritize our highest need schools first. And those are the schools we're selling first because we know those are the children who need highly qualified teachers in front of them the most. Trust me. Trust me. And so when we sell our schools, that's how we prioritize. When the teachers are out there applying and choosing and happening, there's not a lot of control that we have over where they choose to go. And so we see an environment where a teacher may apply to this vacancy at this school, but a more attractive school might be open as well, and then they choose that school. That's correct. So that's kind of the environment that we're in. We, as a recruitment team, like I said, we prioritize our highest need schools, and that's who we're always selling and prioritizing when we send candidates, when we talk about our schools, we talk about these set of schools first, and that's where we prefer to send our highest qualified teachers. What happens beyond that is sometimes out of our control. Thank you, Mr. Collins, and thank you for that response. Um, it is 7.13, and um, this was a great discussion. Thank you for um, 
securing the speakers and this presentation, Dr. Sheffield, and thank you for your um, assistance, Ms. Wood. So at this time, at 714, if there's no additional questions, um, or if there is any additional questions, please send them um, through staff, and we will receive um, the information that we've requested um, through staff as well. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Have a great evening. Meeting is adjourned at 7.14, or I'll entertain a motion for recording purposes. I'll move to adjourn. <laughs> Meeting is adjourned at 7.14 um, by Laura, second by... Collins. Co Mr. Collins, thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Have you so much. Bye-bye.